Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In dis dissection of the muscles of mastication, there are quite a few areas in which you're going to have to be very careful with bone cuts and making sure that you're properly oriented. In the approaching the superficial muscle, the masseter, it's relatively straightforward. It's merely a matter of defining its margins, and when you get to this posterior margin, making sure that you watch for a fiber direction change to differentiate between the superficial head and the deep head of this muscle, this being the deep head at this point. The facial muscles and parotid duct will have to be reflected laterally to expose the full extent of this muscle. The next point in the dissection that we need to consider is the temporal mandibular joint, which is of course located here, and you can demonstrate the movement of the condylar head within the joint capsule by moving the mandible. After identifying the ligaments of this lateral aspect, we'll want to remove them to expose the joint itself. This can be done sometimes by the use of a scalpel, cutting the ligament free from its attachment. Other times, you may have to resort to the use of a chisel to expose these joint cavities. It looks on this particular specimen as though we can do it with a scalpel. Now uh, here we can see I have just exposed then the upper joint cavity. Um, here we need to incise again to plane off the lateral aspect then of the lower joint cavity. And this I think is going to work out all right at this point. I should remind you as we do this that you should review the distribution of the synovial membranes within the temporal mandibular joint. This is best done in your text. To do it with a specimen is really in the area of microanatomy. Now if we remove this small tab, we'll be able to see, I think reasonably clearly, both the upper and lower joint cavities. Here I'll remove just a little bit more of the disc to expose it. <clears throat> Here you can see then the lower joint cavity, the upper joint cavity, and lying between them, the articular disc. If this had not shown these as well as it has, the technique for this would be to place a chisel in this position and then just remove the lateral aspect of the head of the condyle to get further into the joint. Once you've looked at the temporal mandibular joint, the next part of the dissection that you need to consider is the exposure of the temporalis muscle. The portions of the scalp musculature and the galea neurotica can be removed exposing the superficial temporal fascia. Now, this fascia is attached along the posterior contour of the orbit in this area and across to the zygomatic arch. That has been cut, and once this fascia is reflected and the fibers of temporalis exposed, we can get an appreciation of the extent of this large muscle. The temporalis muscle extends posteriorly all the way back to this point and then swings to the infratemporal line, excuse me, to the uh, deep temporal line in this region. To further expose the attachment of this muscle, we need to reflect the zygomatic arch. To do this, you place a probe deep to the zygomatic arch to come out beneath its inferior aspect in this fashion. One should be very careful to identify and preserve the buccal nerve which passed forward in this region and in fact this nerve should be preserved throughout this entire masticator dissection. 
With the probe in the place it's located now, a cut is made through the zygoma, as you can see here, and then a second cut is made at the posterior base of the zygomatic arch in much the same fashion, inserting the probe first and then cutting down to the level of the probe. When this is done, one can reflect the masseter from the mandible, both its superficial head and deep head, identify in passing the blood vessel and nerve supply to the muscle, passing over the arch here of the mandible, and then completely reflect the zygomatic arch to expose the temporal muscle and its attachments. Once we've done this and you have seen the attachment of temporalis to the coronoid process, the next thing we want to do is to demonstrate on the deep aspect of this muscle the nerve supply to it. To do that, we'll use the same technique that we did in looking for some of the nerves of sensation to the face. Namely, we intend to peel the muscle, the temporalis, from its temporal fossa. And as this is drawn down, look on the posterior aspect or deep aspect of this muscle. As you can see here, we have one vessel which is passing out, bifurcating, and then at the border of the infratemporal crest, the deepest point of attachment of the temporalis muscle, you will find the nerve supply sweeping up from the infratemporal fossa and into the deep aspect of the muscle. There may be both an anterior and posterior deep temporal, or there may be a single nerve passing up in this area as we have at this, in this particular specimen. Once you've looked at this aspect of temporalis, we next need to reflect the remaining superficial aspect of the muscles of mastication to expose then those which lie deep to the ramus, namely the pterygoid muscles. To do that, we need to estimate the level of the lingula on the medial aspect of the ramus. It basically is at about this level. But the way in which we identify it in dentistry is very helpful at this point. The lingula is the point at which the inferior alveolar nerve is going to enter this bone. To locate that, we need to palpate the point of concavity of both the anterior and posterior aspects of the ramus. Connecting a line between those two gives us a feeling of the level of the lingula. The cut then to remove this portion of the mandible needs to occur at or slightly above the line we've just drawn. Another cut which must be made in this area has to be made beneath the level of the pterygoid fovea and through the neck of the condyle. And that cut will have to come at about this level. With those two lines then in, as guides, we'll begin the removal of this section of the mandible. However, there are certain features that we want to make sure that we maintain and protect during this procedure. One, as I mentioned earlier, is the buccal nerve, so that must be reflected inferiorly and protected. The other is an artery which disappears deep in the parotid fossa, and you can see it here, the maxillary artery. It will pass just deep, as you can see, to the neck of the condyle. And so we do want to depress it and its associated contents from this area. Again, protect ourselves with a probe prior to making the cut. As a further protection, we will not carry this cut through the medial aspect of the ramus, but rather complete it, as I will show you in a minute, um, by merely fracturing through a line which is started from the lateral aspect. So we'll begin our sectioning at this point. Now that we have cut through the outer cortex of the ramus, we will complete the cut by merely placing the blunt or blade portion of the probe 
into the crack and twisting it to snap the lingual cortex. We'll do the same up here at the neck of the condyle. And once that is finished, the midsection is now mobile. I'd like you to look very carefully beneath the sectioned area and attempt to identify the neurovascular component as it passes into the mandible. At this point, you can see a spur of the lingula very nicely. And right in deep to it, we can see the inferior alveolar nerve and the inferior alveolar artery associated with it. Once you've identified these two structures, we're now free to begin the reflection of this segment of bone, keeping in mind all the time the buccal nerve, which is located deep and in close association with the deep aspect of the temporalis tendon. Now we'll make that reflection. Uh, we'll follow that buccal nerve, as I mentioned, cutting it from its attachment to the temporalis muscle. And as you do it, if you work from this inferior aspect, I think you'll find it most successful. The deep tendon of temporalis comes all the way down on this medial aspect of the ramus and can be freed and worked up to the level of the infratemporal crest, which is what we're viewing at this point. And you can see here, then, nerves entering the deep aspect of temporalis. Now, what we'll do is I'll just section these so that you can complete the reflection, then, of the temporalis. There's one that really wants to hang on. And now what we have exposed, then, is the area of the pterygoid muscles. However, you can see that, other than the fact that we have here an intact buccal nerve, that there is a lot of fat material in this area that needs to be cleaned out in order to show the muscles in their directions. That's what we'll do now. Once this area has been completely cleaned, um, we can begin to see at least the superficial aspect of the pterygoid muscles, two muscles which lie deep then to the ramus. Here, for example, is the lateral pterygoid muscle. The medial pterygoid muscle lies then deep to these two important neural structures, the lingual nerve and the inferior alveolar nerve. You can see its fibers here, and anteriorly, this muscle overlaps then the lateral pterygoid. This then is the superficial approach to the pterygoid muscles. We'll dissect the infratemporal fossa in more complete detail during the next dissection. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.